Hi guys, Alec Pierce Scuba, Vintage Scuba, once again now. <laughs> and the, uh, and the little uh, picture there that Kevin takes, what do you call that? Thumbnail. Thumbnail that he takes with him. And we showed this picture. This picture really has very little to do with the topic I want to share with you today for a few minutes. But it's an interesting picture. As I dig around into my old vintage collection, I have a lot of pictures and so on. And I thought you might get a kick out of this picture, uh, partly because it's a picture of me. Yeah, believe it or not. The guy's sitting down, by the way, not the skinny, tall guy. But uh, that's me sitting down. You can tell it's me, my big head, my big eyes, my big nose. Uh, no, I'm not wearing a wig. I used to have a lot of hair. But you can see I have long hair here. My hair used to come down to my shoulders. That was the, that was the uh, style. In the, this is the early 70s. I don't know the exact year. Uh, at the Seneca College of, uh, it's called the Underwater Skills Program. Basically a commercial diving school. And there I am in my, uh, my uh, outfit, my Mark V outfit. Because we've had this little series, Kevin and I had, have had fun doing this little series about the Stone Age of diving, the 50s and 60s. Now you all know about decompression sickness because you learned about decompressions in your basic course. You know what causes decompression sickness? Nitrogen being forced into your bloodstream by the pressure of the air that you're breathing underwater. And you know what the consequences are. It, it, the nitrogen goes in and then it has to come out before you get back to the surface. If it doesn't come out before you get back to the surface, and I'm making this quick. If it doesn't come out before you get back to the surface, you will come out at the surface, but it will come out in the form of bubbles in your bloodstream, which can be fatal. They will block the flow of blood to your brain or your heart, and uh, basically that's your last big dive. How did we do it in the Stone Age, before computers? We didn't even have good underwater watches. The depth gauges were a bit dodgy. We didn't have SBGs. How did we, how did we uh, ensure that we were safe from, the, the, uh, the, the, from decompression sickness back then? Well, we didn't. No, we didn't worry about it. Why? Because we had these fantastic things called rules of thumb. Now, they're called a rule of thumb because there's no statistical evidence to back them up. <laughs> it's just some guy just made them up. They may or may not be accurate. They may be. They may be a little bit accurate, you see. But lots and lots of rules of thumb. Uh, let me give you an example. There was a rule of thumb that if you ascend slower than your slowest bubbles, you will not get an air embolism. An air embolism, as you know, occurs when you come up too quickly. Not true. <laughs> Not true at all. The slowest bubbles coming out of your regular, and then, which is the slowest bubble? Because there's big ones that go very quickly. There's medium-sized ones that go fast. There's small ones that go, and there's tiny, tiny ones. Which ones do you judge? Which size? Because they all go at different speeds. The slowest bubbles coming out of your regulator ascend at a speed of about 25 feet per minute, which is much, much too slow. The biggest ones go up much faster than that. So it was a rule of thumb that was made up to make you feel good, it didn't necessarily save you from embolism. There was a similar rule of thumb for decompression sickness that a lot of divers followed, myself included. Many of us did. And it fitted the times as well. Picture this. I have a scuba tank, one scuba tank. Because scuba tanks were expensive. Scuba tanks back then were $69, $70. That was a week's wages sometimes. And then you had to pay 75 cents to get it filled at the local fire hall. There were no dive stores. Well, there were a few dive stores in big cities, but most of us lived in small towns. There were no dive stores. You went to the fire hall. And if the fire hall was cooperative, and they loved the income, 75 cents could make a difference. They would fill your scuba tank for 75 cents. So you got one tank filled, off you go to a dive site, and you make a dive. The dive's over. If you like uh, the dive site, you can go snorkeling, you can go fishing, you can lay in the sun, you can do whatever you want, but you can't make a second dive. You only got one tank. You came home. So this rule of thumb that I'm about to tell you about worked really, really well for divers in the Stone Age. <laughs> That's Kevin's term, by the way. I just, I just like it. Most of us had one tank. The rule of thumb was very simple. If you only dive with one tank of air, a steel 72, which was the tank that we had in those days. So if you only dive with one tank of air, a steel 72, you can't get decompression sickness. End of story. Now, you won't find that in any book. Statistically, there's no way of proving that. It really, quite frankly, doesn't mean a darn thing. And it's not even true. Because if you take a good old steel 72, you can dive pretty deep with it. Very deep. Much deeper than you ought to. And if you're careful, if you get down quickly, spend only a few seconds at that maximum depth, which I won't even bother sharing with you, and then fairly quickly come back up to the surface, 
there's your dive. But on a dive like that, sometimes called a bounce dive, on a dive like that, you can very definitely get decompression sickness. So the rule of thumb wasn't exactly true. However, take a regular diver, not suicidal, <laughs> just enjoying himself, scrounging around, maybe on a reef or in a river or a lake somewhere with a steel 72, and he goes down 30, 40, 50 feet, thereabouts, stays down there for 15 or 20 minutes, realizes by way of his J-valve or his watch, if he has an underwater watch, not very many of us did, that he's getting low on air, it's time to come back up. So he heads back up to the surface, gets back to the surface, total time underwater, roughly 40, 45 minutes, maximum depth 40, 45 feet. He won't get decompression sickness. So you see the rule of thumb in that case works, doesn't it? And it worked for most of us. That was the typical of my dive. I would take my tank of air, filled for 75 cents at the fire hall, put it on my back, drive on my motorcycle, yes, to Fenland Falls, 13 <coughs> miles away, and make a nice dive at Fenland Falls. The whole dive might be 35 or 40 minutes. I never got decompression sickness. Good rule of thumb, huh? <laughs> anyway, it wasn't quite that simple, but to a large extent, based on the resources we had, on the information we had, that's how we avoided decompression sickness. Just about that simple. Now, as we diving became more sophisticated, and we got bigger tanks, higher pressure, we started doing more than one dive, we're on a dive boat, we rented tanks and so on, things got more complicated. And hence, fortunately, we now have computers to take care of all that information for us. You simply can't really well calculate all the factors involved in avoiding decompression sickness on your own. Very difficult to measure the depth accurately, the time, service level, and so on. So computers have made a big, big difference. But there you go. Only dive with a single 72 with a J-valve. Now, this is only a cable. With a J-valve on it, and you'd be perfectly safe. Eh, it worked for me. <laughs> okay, some of you old guys, you are diving for a few years, like myself. Get on that comments page and let me know what you think about those ideas. Good. Single 72. Hard to beat. Talk to you soon. Alec Pierce, Scuba, Vintage Scuba. Take care.